All right, so uh, welcome everybody to this first distinguished uh, cybersecurity talk of the 2020 school year. I hope everybody is uh, staying safe, staying sane, which is always a challenge normally, but more so these days, um, and being well. Thank you for spending part of your time with us today. I'm Dr. Rick Forno, the Assistant Director of the UMBC Center for Cybersecurity and the Director of UMBC's Graduate Programs in Cybersecurity. Um, we're very honored today to have a, um, a, a very prominent uh, professor uh, in, many, in so many areas. Uh, their work is widely known uh, in the security and privacy and human rights arena. Uh, professor Ron Diebert from the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Now, for those of you who don't know, Citizen Lab uh, has been around since, I believe, 2001. Um, and they, they do a lot of interdisciplinary work um, at the intersection of global security, human rights, and um, information and communication technologies. So these are a lot of the same uh, areas that actually uh, interest me as well. So I followed their work for, uh, for many years, and um, Ron is a very familiar name in many of my, uh, my literature reviews and uh, things I keep track of. So uh, I don't stalk Ron, but uh, he definitely shows up prominently and regularly in my news feeds. Um, Citizen Lab's uh, research um, gets a ton of media coverage around the world, sometimes front page coverage at the New York Times, the Washington Post and, and others um, for, their, for, for their work in these really critical areas. Um, Professor Diebert is the author of a couple of books, including um, uh, Black Code, Surveillance, Privacy and the Dark Side of the Internet and um, Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society, as well as addition of many chapters, articles, op-eds, commentaries, uh, tweets and so forth over the years on uh, censorship, surveillance, and cybersecurity. Um, notably, in 2013, he was appointed to the Order of Ontario and awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for being among the first to recognize and take measures to mitigate growing threats to communication rights, openness, and security worldwide. So clearly, their their research uh, transcends not just uh, the technical areas, but also uh, the humanities, the social sciences, law to some degree, and policy. Um, and really, they, they are a trendsetter in, in many ways, and uh, their research products typically are used to drive policy discussions in these critical areas, both in the United States, Canada, and certainly elsewhere around the world. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce and turn over the presentation to, uh, to Ron and let him kick things off, kick off his talk. Great. Thank you, Rick. I'll just, I uh, guess, reclaim host. Is that? Uh, um, I'm going to make you, make you presenter. Okay. And you are. Okay. You're on. I'll share screen application Chrome tab. Sorry, folks. Just one second. The always tricky uh, uh, screen share. And there we are. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. Okay, how's that? Looking fine? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, so Rick, thank you for that. Um, I, I won't belabor this. Usually I give a little introduction about Citizen Lab, but Rick did a good job of that. I'll, I'll just say that, uh, uh, emphasize what he pointed out, that we do research on cybersecurity, obviously at, at the University of Toronto, so we're come at it from an academic perspective. Uh, we don't cover the entire terrain, so cybersecurity is an enormous topic, and some people come at it from different perspectives, threats to private sector, government. We look at it from the perspective of threats to human rights, so that gives a kind of color uh, to what we do. Um, we um, and, and it also kind of um, frames um, the perspective that we have and, and how people perceive us. So we've been called a kind of counterintelligence for civil society, or a CSI of human rights. Um, basically, we're a watchdog. So oftentimes, governments and private sector are the focus of our research. So we, we kind of see ourselves as, you know, it's very important for us to be seen as independent. Um, we take very seriously the fact that we're based out of academic organizations. So we don't take funds from the private sector, contract work, or from governments. Our work is um, funded, supported by uh, uh, philanthropic uh, foundations. Um, we're not an advocacy group, so we're not activists. Uh, we don't uh, do that sort of thing. Instead, we see ourselves as uh, putting forward uh, evidence in the public interest. So we're trying to raise awareness through our research. Um, the, I, I would say the key feature of the Citizen Lab is our mixture of methods. So 
I'm a political scientist. International security is, is my background. Um, but many of the people who uh, work at the Citizen Lab come from different disciplines. So we especially leverage computer science, engineering science, and law, as well as uh, people coming from area studies. And our reports are typically a mixture uh, of all of those um, uh, different skills and techniques, which we leverage uh, to do the work that we do. Uh, we work in a number of different areas from documenting censorship worldwide to looking broadly at surveillance issues. Obviously, information technology is the key nexus uh, for us. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the work that we do in the area of um, uh, what we call targeted threats. Uh, so this is basically about documenting uh, targeted espionage. And what I'm going to do today is begin by running through a few stories, showing what we do, how we do it, and what the evidence show before turning uh, to the end to sort of some of the broader implications, looking at the geopolitical context that I think explains what we're seeing. And then I'll end finally um, with some uh, suggestions and a bit of an overview of how I think things could improve the situation that we're seeing um, and, and remedy some of the problems that, that we're identifying because I do think what we're seeing is, is really quite disturbing, frankly, and I think a serious crisis for global civil society. Uh, so when it comes to our work on targeted threats, very often begins with what we call a patient zero. Somebody like this, Ahmad Mansour, uh, who's a human rights defender in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, back in 2016, he received these two text messages, which uh, purport to show evidence of torture in Emirati prisons. But instead of clicking on those links, uh, he forwarded to them uh, to afford them to us uh, for analysis. And one of our uh, lead researchers, Bill Marzak, very technically savvy person, when he received them, uh, immediately he looked at those SMS messages and said, you know, I recognize that shortened domain. It's part of an in infrastructure of a particular company I'm tracking. Let me go grab an iPhone, which he then wiped, and uh, he managed to infect that device. Uh, with uh, the malware that was uh, connected to that uh, shortened link. And it turned out to be the um, uh, malware operated by the very company he suspected it was, which uh, is an Israeli-based spyware company called NSO Group. We had been kind of seeing bits and pieces of their infrastructure turn up and in other investigations that we we're doing, but this was uh, the first real concrete lead and certainly the first time we were able to get a hold of their spyware. Uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so at the time, NSO Group was like most companies in this space, largely invisible, <laughs> except to their clients. Um, over time, I think in part, ironically, because of our investigations, they become much more public facing. When they do speak to the media, they're pretty consistent about their messaging along these three lines. They say, we only sell to governments and we follow Israeli and local laws. Both of those are 100% true and also 100% part of the problem, I would say. Uh, they also claim that their technology is strictly controlled to investigate criminals and terrorists. And this is the dubious claim, because what we're finding is uh, actually that their technology is widely abused instead, uh, in part because of the way governments define criminality and terrorism very broadly, especially, especially in autocratic contexts. Um, and, and so we're seeing human rights defenders, journalists, lawyers, and others that I'll be talking about routinely targeted by their government clients using this technology. It's really a wild west of abusive uh, targeting, in our opinion. Um, so as I said, when Bill got a copy of, of the malware, um, you know, we, we were able to examine it closely. Had Aman Mansour clicked on those links, that malware would have taken advantage of uh, at the time, three separate Apple Zero days, um, flaws in, in their operating system that even Apple, the vendor, didn't know about at the time, this Pegasus, Pegasus Trident exploit chain, they would have been able to observe everything that Ahmad Mansour is doing silently. So uh, take over his device, read all, all of his emails and SMS messages, even those that are encrypted, um, track his geolocation, track his movements, turn on the camera, uh, turn, turn on the audio cap, capture mechanisms to be able to capture ambient sound, for example, people meeting in a room. So obviously very uh, powerful stuff. Um, so what we did um, is uh, do a, a immediate responsible disclosure 
to Apple. And remarkably, we received the text messages August 11th. And as you can see from this New York Times story, August 25th, uh, two weeks later, Apple pushed out an update. Um, and every iPhone and MacBook got a security update to patch these uh, vulnerabilities. So we took out this exploit or, or uh, chain of exploits, which affected about 1 billion devices worldwide. So in terms of impact for our research, this is definitely one of the bigger ones. Um, now, uh, it's often the case that uh, when we are exploring artifacts like this, we're looking at the infrastructure of these companies, and I'll talk a bit in a minute about that part of the research. Um, but in this particular case, uh, we had noticed um, from a variety of different sources, Twitter comments, media reporting, talking to people, and as I said, some uh, artifacts relating to domain registration, that there seemed to be a lot of NSO activity in Mexico. So it's often the case what we do in these uh, circumstances is we find a partner in those countries, somebody that we can trust, that knows the human rights community well. And we did in this circumstance team up, uh, have a, one of our senior researchers take the lead, John Scott Railton, we call him JSR. And he met up primarily with this person, Luis Fernando Garcia, at a Mexican NGO called R3D. And we basically explained to Louise, look, here's what we want you to do. We want you to go out in your community. Uh, who are the likely targets of this type of surveillance that aren't criminals or terrorists? We obviously, that doesn't interest it, us. People who are broadly within the human rights space. And it wasn't long before uh, Louise went out that he started surfacing these various text messages. Here's just a couple samples, uh, mostly um, threatening SMS messages or provocative SMS messages, uh, all designed to socially engineer, trick somebody into clicking on the exploit link, which obviously we don't show. Some of them are pretty nasty, things like um, you know personalized messages about family members and so on. So starting in about 2017 to right through to 2019, we did a series of reports about the abuse of NSO spyware in uh, the Mexican content context. And, and frankly, some of the findings were really quite disturbing. Here's one case. Uh, this is uh, Javier Hardenas, uh, who is an uh, investigative journalist working on cartel issues. Uh, he was gunned down in a cartel-linked cartel hit in Mexico. Um, and the next day, one of his colleagues, uh, editor at the newspaper that he works for, received a, a uh, SMS message claiming to have evidence about who was responsible for his execution, and we were able to verify that contained an NSO exploit link. So ironically, even though the, the NSO and the government of Mexico and its other clients say that it uses this powerful spyware to investigate serious issues of crime and terrorism, including drug trafficking, here we found a murdered journalist was targeted with this uh, spyware, someone who had been investigating the cartels themselves. Um, so the situation across Mexico was really quite um, profound in terms of the scope and scale of the targeting going on. So we had around 25 individuals that we were able to confirm, positively identify, who were targeted in Mexico using NSO spyware, including many journalists, lawyers, even public health advocates, uh, opposition, uh, anti-corruption advocates, and even international, investiga international investigators who were given diplomatic immunity to investigate this horrible 2014 mass disappearance of 43 students. Um, they had all of their devices targeted when they were inside Mexico doing their investigation. So the Mexican case is really a, a good example of this type of restless, reckless targeting serial abuses, uh, not only going after individuals, but going after members of families of individuals, including a minor child of a prominent journalist in Mexico who was attending boarding school in the United States, had his iPhone targeted with NSO spyware uh, while he was in that country. Um, as I said, that type of pathway to investigation that we follow is combined with network infrastructure scanning that we do. And, and this, you know, saying network infra infrastructure scanning simplifies uh, a lot of various techniques and access to data feeds that we employ that, you know, have matured over the decade or so that we've been doing this. 
Um, but the bottom line here is, you know, looking at the kind of typical infrastructure of one of these spyware companies, uh, they want to obviously obfuscate what they're doing to protect their clients. So they have, you know, a variety of proxy chains and cloud computing services that they employ to do that. Um, but of course, they also leave trails. And if you know where to look, especially if you've been able to, as we have, get a copy of the malware, reverse engineer it, find out how it communicates, you can develop uh, the equivalent of a kind of digital fingerprint for these companies and start to scan the internet looking for their infrastructure and their government clients. And of course, you know, we don't, it's not just all technical work. We do open source intelligence gathering as well. It's remarkable how much you can find on things like LinkedIn or also, um, you know, uh, hacked material that ends up in the public domain. Um, so the first time we did this was with a company called Finfisher in 2015, which is a Swiss, German, UK company, depending on uh, the year in question. They, they, like many of these companies, they have different jurisdictions that they move around in and a bit of a shell game, largely to avoid accountability, I would say. Um, and the picture that you see here is representative of this entire space. So as you can see, these are government clients of this powerful spyware. What sticks out if you go through them one by one are many of these countries have very poor human rights records, terrible public oversight and accountability over their law enforcement and intelligence agencies, and a track record of using surveillance technologies for extrajudicial killings or you know, arrests of journalists and human rights defenders. Uh, the next year, we did the same thing with this Italian company hacking team. Well, actually, it's other, other years around, 2014, 2015. Same point, though, hacking team, Italian company, uh, 21 suspected government users, a lot of them uh, with some uh, you know, pretty painful human rights track records. Now, uh, we did something similar with, um, uh, sorry, uh, with NSO. Uh, from the time we received that, um, that, uh, those text messages from Anman Mansour through to 2018, so over a two-year period, uh, and frankly, continuing to this day, we've been mapping their infrastructure and one of the techniques we use, and you'd have to ha have Bill as a guest uh, in your lecture to properly explain this. He, he's really ingeniously employed this DNS cache probing technique, which allows him to see suspected Pegasus infections. So this map is not clients. What these are are countries within which infections are occurring. And in the same report, which is called Hide and Seek, if you Google it, you'd see we also break down suspected government operators of, of the spyware. So you're seeing here is a, a picture of, of global espionage taking place in more than 40 countries involving about 30 government operators. And of course, espionage taking place in countries like the United States, uh, quite significant there, <clears throat> as well as Canada. Now, when we published this report, one thing stuck out to us, and that was what we inferred to be the Saudi operator group using NSO spyware. And here's a picture of suspected infected devices linked to that kingdom operator. Um, and one of them, of course, is Canada. And being a Canadian organization, we were pretty interested in following this up. All we could see from our network vantage point, from the data that we're collecting, is that there was one infected device in Canada, in the region of Quebec, that was very consistently checking in at roughly the same time of day on one internet service provider, and then in the evening on a second internet service provider. And that's all we had to go on. Um, so we decided, hey, let's see if we could figure out who this person is. Uh, we drew up a short list of likely targets in Quebec that we thought the Saudi regime would be interested in, and we literally went door to door. Um, I should say that, you know, as, as a university research group, everything that we do is governed by research ethics protocols, and that includes interaction with, with humans who are treated as human subjects. So we have to, you know, sign confidentiality agreements with them to protect their, their um, data and their confidentiality. And so we went around and we started interviewing people, and we came across the target, which was really like, a, you know, finding a needle in the haystack. Turned out to be this guy, Omar Abdulaziz, um, who at that time was very prominent on YouTube. He had a, a satirical YouTube show, kind of like 
Stephen Colbert of the Gulf. Um, he uh, came to Canada from Saudi Arabia um, and then sought asylum and was, was given um, asylum status in Canada in 2014. And from that vantage point, from that perch in Quebec, Canada, uh, he would routinely kind of mock Mohammed bin Salman, which is uh, never a good idea. Um, so he, he's also a student at Bishop's University. And this was in the summer when we contacted him. And lo and behold, when, we, uh, when he signed the consent form, we looked through his uh, SMS messages. We discovered that he received this message. And we could tell by that domain, we had been tracking NSO's infrastructure and we knew we had a, a number of domains that we knew were registered by them. So we could see this was definitely an NSO domain and a shortened link that was being um, managed by the Saudi operator group. So we had just on this basis of the text message, definitive proof that he had been targeted. Um, the other confirming bit of information was his pattern of life. So as I said, our, the vantage point from which we were looking at this, we could see this infected device being consistently used in the morning in one location and then the evening in another location. So in the morning, he was checking in from a large consumer ISP where he was living in Sherbrooke, Quebec. And then every evening, he, classes were not in session at Bishop's University, but he would go and use the gym uh, at Bishop's University and connect to their, um, to their Wi-Fi network. And so based on the SMS messages and the pattern of life, we knew that we had positive confirmation that Saudi Arabia was spying on this um, uh, uh, exiled Saudi person in Quebec. Uh, and so we went ahead and wrote up the report and published it. What we didn't know at the time, our report came out on October 1st, 2018. On October 2nd, 2018, Jamal Hoshoji, the Washington Post journalist, went into the Istanbul consulate in uh, at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, and of course he was executed. Uh, what we didn't know at the time uh, was that Jamal and Omar were close confidants, and uh, the Saudi operators who had targeted Omar's device were able to eavesdrop on everything that they were doing. Turns out that they had quite provocative plans, provocative from the context of Saudi authorities, to mount a social media opposition campaign that they called about the bees. And here is um, actual text messages between them over what they thought was uh, encrypted WhatsApp messages. Um, of course, um, Saudi intelligence was basically eavesdropping, looking over their shoulders as they were discussing how to mobilize people and how they would finance it and so on. Um, and later we confirmed that several other uh, members of uh, Jamal's inner circle had been targeted in the same manner as did Amnesty International and, and their tech team. <clears throat> now, there was a pretty significant development with NSO's technology uh, that we discovered in April and May um, simultaneously with WhatsApp discovering. Um, basically, they had innovated their spyware to the point where um, they could take advantage of a flaw in WhatsApp's protocol and infect a device simply by placing a, a video call. A person wouldn't even have to answer um, the phone. They wouldn't have to click on a, a link. So there's no social engineering involved, kind of like the nuclear option. And um, what we did is we, we discovered this from a, a lawyer who had been targeted in this manner. He was curious because he recognized, hey, there are all these drop calls coming from area codes that I don't know what's what's this about and he passed it to us for analysis we got in touch with WhatsApp security team and they said aha you know we we thought something like this was going on so we entered into an arrangement with WhatsApp to volunteer uh, to assist them in identifying the civil society targets of this um, of these infection attempts and so they provided to us data uh, which basically boiled down to simply phone numbers for a two-week period of time for which they had visibility in the April-May period. And we then spent about eight months doing open source research and eventually discovered that of the thousand people that were targeted, more than a hundred were what we would categorize as civil society. In other words, clearly not terrorists or criminals. And we actually reached out and notified those people. 
Uh, that was uh, quite an interesting experience. Obviously, anyone you know listening to this can recognize there's an obvious paradox involved with us having to reach out to someone whose device is infected with spyware. Um, but we did this, <clears throat> and then gradually the people over the course of the last year or so have started to come out publicly and say, yes, I am one of these targets, and we've been confirming them. Um, so some of the targets that came out right away uh, illustrate uh, the abusive nature of this technology. So Rwanda is a client of NSO, uh, and many of the opposition figures who fled Rwanda, who've been tracked by death squads sent out by Paul Kagame, we confirmed that their devices uh, were targeted in this manner. India, more than 40 opposition figures, lawyers and others were targeted um, as really quite a, a national ordeal in that country. Uh, more recently, Catalan politicians and civil society members were targeted, and even a Togolese bishop and priest, uh, we discovered Togo is a client, obviously a country that has serious democratic accountability problems. Uh, the Catholic Church is part of the opposition there, and these priests and a bishop, uh, we confirmed, were targeted. So, you know, picture that you see here, you know, none of these are criminals or terrorists unless defined as such by autocrats and dictators. Now, I should emphasize, you know, I'm giving a little slice of the research that we do around targeted espionage, profiling this, you know, very lucrative market of high-end uh, spyware made by companies like Israel-based NSO Group. You know, that's pretty much the high-end. But not all countries use this type of technology. Um, others use more homegrown methods or very cheap methods. And the bottom line is, you know, whatever does the trick is just fine. And I'll give you, I could give countless examples of this going back to our very first report on targeted espionage, the GhostNet report. Um, but here's one recently from a report we published last year called Dark Basin, um, where a number of targets uh, received um, uh, shortened links purporting to come from colleagues containing sensitive information or documents that they might be interested in. They got suspicious. They shared with us the shortened links. And we started tracking these shortened links and discovered that there was a pattern to them that we could essentially reverse engineer and in some cases identify who the targets were based on the email. So there were 28 different URL shorteners used by whoever was doing uh, the targeting. And we hadn't figured that out yet until we got to this point. And uh, we were able to enumerate more than 27,000 uh, different long URLs, each of which led to a different dark basin, is the name of the operator group we had given them that time, a credential phishing website. And in some cases, there were emails actually included in the targeted URL, and that's how we could start identifying who the victims were. Um, and, you know, there's a typical example. This is not fancy spyware. It's simply if, you know, somebody has some, um, you know, Photoshop editing software and they create something that looks like a Dropbox link, looks like something very confidential. If you click on it, you're asked to enter in your credentials, and then they vacuum up all of your emails. Um, the problem was, uh, you know, this uh, shortened link system they were using, the operators were very careless. They were making test URL shorteners that they would include as bait uh, their own CVs and LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn profiles. So we very quickly were able to discern who was behind all of this. And is, it's what turned out to be now this notorious Indian hack for hire company called Beltrox, which is at the heart of this massive targeted espionage campaign that had been affecting uh, groups in a number of different sectors. The one that stood out for us was uh, very large NGOs working in um, environmental advocacy areas, all of them united in their opposition to ExxonMobil. Um, they all had uh, been hacked uh, by Beltrox. Um, and at their request, we've actually turned over the data that we collected to uh, Department of Justice in the United States, and there is currently an ongoing investigation, and they're kind of working their way up. So um, there is uh, uh, criminal charges have been laid against uh, this company, Beltrox, and some of their principals, as well as um, some of the intermediaries in the United States 
and you know SDNY, very busy uh, agency, is as I understand it anyway, you know, working through this investigation. But it goes to show you that you know not everything has to be super sophisticated or expensive to accomplish the same aim. Um, and this is another illustration, a uh, four-year study we did, a uh, really careful um, comparative study involving about 10 different NGOs over a four-year period of time where we collected uh, targeted espionage from uh, those organizations against their infrastructure. And the remarkable thing there was in all the targeting that we found in that four-year period, there was only one zero day. Most of them were old days unpatched vulnerab vulnerabilities. And again, it illustrates a couple of things. One is, if it works, why bother changing it or burning a very expensive zero day? And also, a lot of the targets in civil society have unpatched infrastructure, right? They, they're using pirated software, they can't afford it, or they simply don't have capacity to update or understanding to update. So I'd like to take a step back now in the, in the final minutes and, and look at the broader context and and what to do about all of this. Um, so this is the big picture for, for us at the Citizen Lab, what we are seeing across uh, the, the research of the last 10 years or so. You have a kind of, you know, perfect storm is, is used often as a metaphor, uh, overused some might say, but I really think it applies here. We've got these kind of tectonic forces that are coming together. One is rising authoritarianism. Um, so unfortunately, we, we live in a time where democracy is largely in retreat. Even countries that made a transition into democracy are sliding back into authoritarianism. And there's a lot of corruption and kleptocracy in the world. That's one factor. So there, there's very little accountability within a lot of governments around how this technology is used. And a lot of them define uh, journalists, human rights defenders, and anyone that's opposition as legitimate targets, as a criminal, like in Saudi Arabia, if you're a, if you criticize Mohammed bin Salman, you're a criminal, you're a terrorist, right? And that that means that that definition that unlocks access to all of this technology is largely meaningless. Um, the other part of it uh, on the on the top right here, you see, is you have this blossoming market for private intelligence, dark PR, surveillance services, even hack for hire operations operating out of Delhi, India. Um, so there, there's just a, a bonanza of services and products out there to service these government clients. And at the same time, in the background, you, backdrop, you have uh, cyber offense doctrine being normalized. Everybody, you know, defense is hard, so everybody's going on the offense instead. Um, there's so many, um, you know, so many parts of the attack surface that uh, allow this type of... Um, you know, malfeasance, and it's pretty hard to resist. So there's just a kind of, you know, boom and offense going on. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, is shrinking spaces for global civil society, And which, which is interesting because early in my career, there was a big kind of narrative going out there that um, uh, civil society, we're, we're going to see a, a huge transformation in democratization, liberalization, civil society because of the internet. Uh, the Arab Spring, uh, wow, we're seeing people movements because of Twitter and social media. And of course, what we are seeing, you know, empirically is the exact opposite, that the very devices that um, civil society members hold in their hands are um, leaving them vulnerable to this type of very powerful surveillance uh, technology that is poorly regulated, if regulated at all, and prone to abuse. And there's another part of the story here that's very important to understand, especially for the audience with whom I'm speaking, I would say, there is a market failure for, um, uh, cy for cybersecurity for civil society. So, you know, you just look at the comparison here, right? For an industry or government actor, um, however their network defenses are constituted poorly or better than others, um, of course, we see data breaches all the time, but at least they have usually deep pockets. They can go out and hire FireEye, Mandiant, whoever else in the industry to come in, remediate, put you know middle boxes on their networks, and and help them fight those type of attacks. Typically, an NGO, especially one in the developing world, barely has a person who can you know handle plugging in the printer or the projector, let alone deal with advanced persistent threats. 
So you have this situation where you have, you know, across the board, uh, generally speaking, low IT capacity, resource constraints, basic policies and security practices are not understood. Um, you have a lot of insecure technology, pirated software, lots of misinformation going around. Um, you know, oh, use this, try Signal, try Tor, you know. Um, and what I can tell you from our research is that these attacks are really getting to the heart of what these groups do, disrupting work, um, safety, trust are being um, compromised. It's, it's like sand is being you know, thrown, cast into the machinery of how these groups operate. Everyone's suspicious of, of emails they get. They don't want to speak you know, frankly over, over the internet. And the bottom line, the really important point is the same groups that target industry and governments are also targeting civil society. And, and we have demonstrated this through evidence, like APT1, other Chinese operators, if you look uh, at who they are targeting, often the case in the media, private sector compromises, government compromises, you know, uh, get the most attention. But those operator groups see civil society as just an important, as, as an important threat. And they're throwing the same uh, resources and infrastructure at those groups to neutralize uh, what they're doing. Uh, here's a paper that I recently published with two colleagues of mine, sorry, a graph from a paper uh, of, a, of, of, of mine that I co-published with my colleagues John Lindsay and Leonard Mashmeyer. And what we did here to show this point is we went, we went through and basically read and categorized close to a thousand threat intelligence reports, over 700 from industry, uh, and then a bunch of other ones from groups like civil society. Um, the outside of industry, there are very few other groups that do this type of work. So we looked at all the threat intelligence reports to see how they characterized, if at all, civil society victims, knowing that many of the operator groups target civil society just as readily as they do industry and government. And what we found was kind of shocking. Um, most of them don't mention those targets at all. And when they do, there's this kind of secondary or passing mention. Um, so there's a serious market failure when it comes to threat intelligence companies. They don't see these you know, poorly resourced NGOs as clients. And as a consequence, they don't highlight them in their industry facing public reporting. And so as a consequence, a lot of people who study this area are getting a distorted picture of the actual threat landscape. The vast majority, you know, I would flip this pie graph around completely to say the reality is completely different. What's happening is that we're seeing this you know, torrent of unbridled targeted espionage against civil society that's growing in leaps and bounds around the world. So lastly, what do we do about it? Well, the answer here is no one single approach suffices. Um, a lot of people instinctively go to government regulation and specifically export controls. The problem here, frankly, is that a lot of the governments have a dog in this race and they don't want to get too deep into regulation because it might expose what they are doing and their links to this very industry. Um, furthermore, if you look at NSO Group, Israel uh, does undertake export controls. Every single NSO sale has to go through a licensing process through the Israeli Ministry of Defense and they routinely approve these. Uh, probably because they gain some kind of SIGINT uh, quid pro quo. That's a guess on my part. Um, you know, it's very convenient to have a local company networked into a lot of other countries gathering this type of intelligence. Um, so they certainly aren't going to crack down on NSO. But there's been some recent developments in Europe. Um, perhaps these will lead somewhere. I think in the long term, maybe in the short term, not so sure. In the short term, I think uh, a very promising path, at least in terms of maybe bringing pain to the companies or their shareholders, is litigation and law enforcement. So if you look at NSO right now, um, there are probably, by my count, at least a half dozen or more cases of litigation or criminal investigation involving either the company itself or its clients. And so as that begins to unfold, I think we could see greater restraints introduced uh, through that. Um, until that time though, here's what we kind of 
have been, you know, at a high level at least, advising people when they ask us what should be done. Uh, we see the real solution here as a multi-pronged community approach. So, you know, civil society's technical capacity needs to be addressed in some other way than just, you know, Westerners, people from the global north parachuting in for a week and giving security trainings. Those don't work. Instead, uh, the model that does work is where you have designated people inside the organizations and they get support to go off and get trained themselves. They come back and they're there as a point person. They understand, they can receive uh, indicators. They know what to do with them. They can educate their community in their local languages and bring up their digital hygiene. Um, we also uh, have seen benefits from industry um, and a, an appetite among some of the threat intelligence companies to contribute to this space. And I've been advocating uh, to some of the companies and to others about ideas like having uh, you know, threat intelligence companies allow some of their workers to do some pro bono work on the side for civil society, or maybe to take a six month sabbatical. This would benefit the companies because they'd see about you know, this other threat landscape. And then of course we need more of the type of evidence-based research that Citizen Lab does combine with investigative journalism and advocacy and legal support, which again could come through some kind of pro bono way um, now, all of this has to be paid for in some manner, which is why we've been, you know, really working hard to get to the funders, the foundations, MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation, and others like them to say, you know, if you really want to address this crisis, here's the hard work that needs to be done. And I think we're, we're hearing kind of a positive feedback about that from them. Um, and I hope, I hope, you know, this will remediate right, right now, which is really kind of a scary story. I mean, um, to the extent that, you know, civil society represents the sinews of liberal democracy and it's shrinking and being threatened and, it, you know, being neutralized in these manner, in the manners that I described, that's a serious problem for all of us. So I will uh, end it there and be glad to take uh, any questions or comments from anybody. I'm going to try to end my screen sharing now. Okay, Ron. I'm back. You're back. Great. <laughs> um, yes, we do have time for some questions. Um, if you have a question, please uh, either put it in the uh, chat box or just type in your name, and then I'll call on you to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, Ron, I have a question to kick things off. Um, Citizen Lab is definitely a unique organization, uh, you know, you know, kind of one foot in industry, one foot in academia, uh, which is kind of cool. And I'm sure you've been courted by private sector for buyouts and things like that because your work is so groundbreaking. My question is, can you talk a little bit about how you interact with the university setting, particularly when it comes to doing the outreach and you hinted on you know, IRB and ethics reviews and things like that, because it, it can get kind of sticky generally, but more so given what the particular topics and issues that you're discussing, where there really are people's lives at risk. Can you talk mm -hmm. about the relation, a little bit more about that relationship within the university setting? Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad to because I. I feel philosophically to me as a. You know, I'm a full tenured professor, um, and I. I really feel strongly that what we are doing lives up to the to the mandate of the university. You know, what the university in a, in a general sense to me anyway is about. You know, acting as a custodian of knowledge and free inquiry, no matter what the consequences. And, you know, we don't often live up to that. And unfortunately, a lot of universities see themselves as pathways to employment rather than this original notion. And, and so to me, it's fundamental that we, you know, speak truth to power. Um, that, that's kind of how I see it. Um, it, it. And, you know, outsiders often ask me, why are you at the university? You know, and I'll, I'll say what I just said. But also the university has a lot of resources, right? Like, first of all, um, I think the fact that we're based at a, not just any university, but you know, Canada's top research university gives us a degree of protection. So it's one thing to target uh, an NGO. Uh, it's another to go after the University of Toronto. Like it just, it, it's a significant optical difference, I would say in terms of perception. Um, and the university has been very helpful when it comes to some of the, um, you know, the support that they provide to us, especially on the legal side. So probably not surprisingly, 
I didn't talk about it in this presentation, but we've been sued. We've been threatened with suits. We've been threatened in other ways. The university has provided legal counsel for us that we can go to to protect ourselves and allow us to do the work that we do, some of which involves some pretty contentious technical methods as well, like reverse engineering. Um, so we want to be able to back that up. Um, it's not always great. I mean, um, yeah, there there are um, questions that come like, what are those? You know, what are those people? What's Debert Shop doing at Citizen Lab? And oh my gosh, we're hearing about like black cube operations against them. And, and is this something that I have to be concerned about? And frankly, we have prior to the pandemic, we had some pretty serious physical security issues that we had to deal with. Um, but for the most part, I would say the university is very supportive. Uh, they recognize that this is research in the public interest. They like the fact that we're in global media, seemingly routinely. Um, university of Toronto's name and news stories helps. Of course. <laughs> so we make sure we get attribution right. And of course, you know, um, we have colleagues in other departments that that we work with, not just at the University of Toronto, like most of the engineering computer science people who work with, with me or have worked with me at Citizen Lab, we've collaborated with, have come from, frankly, American universities, Berkeley, University of New Mexico, Princeton, and others. Um, we've had really good collaborations with them. Great. Thanks very much. A uh, question came in, and I'll read it because there may be some people who are on the phone. Uh, thank you, Professor Debert. Outstanding talk. I'm curious how the Citizen Lab team is assembled. What fields do your researchers come from? Are most from academia, the commercial sector, or otherwise? That's a very good question. So uh, originally, they were almost all uh, students uh, that I recruited as researchers. And, you know, uh, uh, some of them developed over time, you know, as we matured, the staff matured, um, and, you know, some of them became uh, full-time appointed staff. So these are like uh, research associates at, at the university. They're like within the union and their full-time job is working at Citizen Lab. They're no longer students. I'd say about 50% of the lab is constituted like that. Problem I had in in and around, I'd say, 2008 to 2012 was a retention issue. So, um, you know, very capable among among the best, I would say, at doing this type of detective work, obviously could get paid way more by the private sector. And so I came up with a, a creative way of uh, developing fellowships. And, you know, I talked in my presentation about this pro bono model for industry. And there have been quite a few instances where I've had Citizen Lab fellows who come from industry and we work out an arrangement where they're able to, um, you know, firewall the work they do with their companies, but maybe spend 10% time or more or moonlighting or whatever working for Citizen Lab. And that's really allowed us to punch above our weight. Um, and that fellowship model is one I've employed quite successfully. University's fine with it. Um, we give people appropriate compensation, but they're allowed to still uh, have a full-time job elsewhere. Oh, that, that, that's a great model. Um, all right, so this comes from uh, Dr. Finan in our computer science and electrical engineering department. Uh, some local government organizations, e.g. in a city or county, also suffer from a lack of good IT support. Might these entities also be targeted using the same vulnerabilities? And I should add that uh, several of us here at UMBC and on the call uh, are engaged in, uh, in work looking at municipal, local cybersecurity concerns. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, you're all experts in this area as much as I am, and, and you no doubt see that there is, you know, uh, it, for pardon the expression, a shit show everywhere when it comes to cybersecurity. I was the co-chair of the University of Toronto's Information Security Council, and, you know, universities are a mess, you know, people trying hard, but uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a disaster because it's so hard, right? Uh, you got... Um, a technological environment that seems to be almost designed from the ground up to be insecure. All, you know, like so. Um, every entity, every organization has cybersecurity challenges. The threat landscape is uneven, though. I would say it depends on your your you know your own personal risk and and your threat model. So for the groups that we work with, they're very high risk. You know, a, a typical municipality is not going to be a target for Saudi espionage or, you know, unless it's it's by extension or collaterally Russian or Chinese espionage, you know, the, 
that I need to qualify that obviously in a way, but it's it's just not the same as like somebody who works on human rights law or defends somebody, you know, as a journalist doing investigative journalism on, you know, sensitive Chinese issues concerning a Uyghur population. That makes you a high value target. And as a consequence, adversaries concentrate resources on them. But yeah, lots of municipalities suffer from similar problems, maybe a slightly different scale, depending on where they're located and their budget and so on, as do like a lot of NGOs in the global south. Um, Armin, I believe you have a question. Please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, just quick question. I was wondering in your research, uh, Professor, have you guys come across any domestic actors trying to uh, access this technology and make use of it um, at home or even within the United States? Just this past week, we saw uh, groups that were messaging people and threatening them to vote for Donald Trump and pretending to be the Proud Boys when really it turned out, or it's alleged that, that they're foreign actors. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, has there been any indication that domestic groups especially ones that, you know, they're kind of underground and they only operate on social media, trying to get this technology as well to, to make use of it at home. Yes, is the short answer. And, you know, first of all, it depends on what technology you're speaking of. If it's spyware in particular, or even like if we just say NSO, there are, um, you know, th there, are, there is evidence to suggest that NSO is making a, um, a, a concerted effort to develop clientele, especially in the law enforcement area in the United States. And then if you broaden out beyond just spyware, um, first of all, I have to recognize that my country and yours are part of the Five Eyes you know, Alliance. And um, although they likely contract out to companies that are more careful than NSO, in other words, they don't sell to government operators, I would hope, that are using them to go after the type of civil system society targets we have seen, they are still, um, you know, developing that, that uh, toolkit and, um, you know, contributing to the marketplace, to the private industry. Um, we just produced a report, I didn't talk it here, about it here, uh, concerning algorithmic policing in Canada. And of course, that's a, that's a big topic in, in the United States as well. There's been a proliferation of products and services to law enforcement, everything from, you know, cell site simulators to license plate readers to facial recognition technologies to drones and so on um, that are creating kind of superpower policing capabilities, um, lacking appropriate safeguards to prevent abuse of power. We do look into that. Um, you know, we've done research on those topics. Uh, for sure. And I, I, I would say that, you know, the context is different. In, in most democratic countries, uh, the concerns are slightly muted, I would say, although no less important, because you do have proper, uh, or at least, you know, um, uh, the skeleton of proper oversight and accountability. The, the story really is, though, that accountability, generally speaking, is weakening even in liberal democratic contexts. And, you know, things like inspectors general offices or, you know, privacy commissioners, whistleblower complaint mechanisms, things like that that protect against the abuse of power have been whittled away over the years while the, the policing capacities have been amplified and intelligence capacities have amplified. That's a pretty dystopic picture if I ever heard one. Um, uh, not a question, but a comment from a freshman, uh, Kay Wuntia, very enthusiastic, uh, appreciating your time today. Uh, as a UMBC undergrad, um, uh, they're pursuing a computer science BS, a psychology BA, and minor in social work. And right. uh, they talk about, the, the students' comments talks just about the interdisciplinarity of um, the things that you spoke about, and you really spoke to their interests. Um, so they didn't really have a question, but they, they uh, you, I think, energized them to, uh, you know, double down on, on their current academic program because they see um, how it all comes together. So um, that, that's I'm really nice. You motivated here. That's really nice. I, I feel strongly about true interdisciplinary work. You, you often hear about it in the university context, but it's not often practiced. You know, even you have these centers of interdisciplinary research and it usually ends up being like, a sociologist in one office and a geographer in the next office, but they don't really do anything together. Um, uh, few centers actually apply it 
uh, and it, it's in obviously in the in the context within which we live it's so important right like we're so surrounded by technology and we need to you know bridge the gaps between the disciplines i feel very strongly about it. so i'm glad to hear this type of comment for sure yeah and one thing uh, open floor spaces and floor plans doesn't automatically mean interdisciplinary success will take place <laughs> that's right exactly um, so we're coming up on the top of the hour are there any other questions or comments from uh, people uh, joining us today Give folks a second to throw anything into the chat box. Uh, Rick, this is Anupam. I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Debert. I, I still remember the Aurora report when it came out um, uh, back, what was it, 2010, something like that. And um, I happened to be in India then, and I knew what kind of a, that's the first and perhaps the last time I have seen a cybersecurity story on the front page of uh, the Times of India. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that you know, we really got our start doing this back in 2009 with the tracking GhostNet report. We were part of the team that published that report, which is arguably the first public evidence-based report on cyber espionage. And it's interesting. It was a bombshell of a report um, because of the scope and scale of the espionage being undertaken and the targets. Um, but what is maybe not really understood is A, we we're an academic group that was coming at this, and B, our entry point was the office of the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala in India. Uh, that's where we first did our field research. And uh, you know, we then discovered from their compromises, uh, essentially you know, visibility into the operator's network. So we're coming at it from a human rights civil society perspective, first of all. Great. Are there any other questions or comments from the floor? Going once. Going twice. This is my, my trick, it usually works. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, Professor Debert, thanks again for taking time out of what I know is always a perpetually busy day <laughs> up at the Citizen Lab to, uh, to join us today for this talk and uh, share, share some wisdom with, uh, with our group. Uh, as a reminder to all, all those on the call, this um, will be, has been recorded and will be appearing on the UMBC Center for Cybersecurity YouTube page if you want to reflect on it or use it in your courses down the road. So um, on behalf of UMBC and the Center for Cybersecurity, uh, again, thank you, Ron, and thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay sane. Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate it. And I just put the link to our website in the chat window for those who want to follow up on our reporting. It's just citizenlab.ca. Thanks so much.